Well, hello, my name is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elville and Associates, and welcome to our webinar today, a caregiver panel led by Ms. Ellen Platt, a certified aging life care manager and president and founder of the Option Group. I'd also like to welcome our three panelists as well, Ms. Deidre McGee, Ms. Jackie Tangiers, and Mr. Noel White, who will all share a bit about themselves as we get started momentarily. So that's how this will work today. If you're new to our webinars, if you are welcome, we're glad you're here. And if you're a frequent attendee, we're thankful as always for your support of our webinar series. So you as the attendee are currently in listen only mode. However, if and when you have questions or comments, and we really want to encourage participation during the webinar, please note them in the questions panel or chat box on the right hand portion of your screen. And we'll also be unmuting all attendees so you can speak through your microphones at the end of the presentation to share your thoughts with Ellen and the panelists. You also received a handout Ellen wanted me to share with everyone by email yesterday. It looks like this. It is a caregiver stress test. So if for some reason you did not receive this, it is currently located in the handout section in the panel on the right hand portion of your screen to download at this time. Everyone will also receive a post webinar feedback email right after the presentation. And we ask that you please just take a couple minutes to fill out this really simple survey to offer us your thoughts about the presentation. Elvon Associates, which is where I work, works every day with clients with the ideals of, cl ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion in mind. And we're always available for consultations to discuss your family's planning needs and look forward to being a resource to you in any way now and in the future. So we have a lot to cover and a lot to discuss and a lot of information to share with you. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Ellen, who will get us started. So Ellen. Hey, thank you, Jeff. All you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity today. We're really happy to have this chance to kind of share a little bit. Um, we, I'm Ellen Platt with the Option Group. I do private case management and advocacy. And I frequently find myself in the situation where we're helping caregivers and caregiving families navigate their turbulence and help solve problems relating to their situation and their issues as being a caregiver. So first off, thank you for being here today. This is a great step to kind of getting resources and information that we hope is going to help you as a caregiver. Um, and then we also want to say, um, because we thank you very much for being a caregiver, it's, it's one of the, the hardest jobs, but sometimes can also be one of the most thankless jobs. So you are our unsung heroes, and we want to recognize you here in May, which is Older Americans Month. So thank you for joining us today. And um, what I'd like to do really quickly is so that you know who the panelists are, I'd like them to um, share their name and um, just a sentence or two about their caregiving journey. Uh, Jackie, would you like to start? Sure, Ellen. Um, my name's Jackie Tangiers, um, and um, I actually work for Ellen as a care manager. Um, and a little bit about my caregiving journey, um, I'm going to say probably started a good 12 or so years ago um, that I had a sibling pass away, um, and then a couple of years later I had another sibling pass away. And I think the... Um, impact of that kind of made me realize like oh gosh you know somebody needs to be watching mom and dad and originally it was four of us and now it's you know two of us um and i'm uh one of two and i'm a daughter and i have a brother so i think if i had to do a poster stamp version i think that's kind of what started my caregiving journey is to kind of have that no 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 how about you Hi, my name is Noah White. I am a current caregiver for an adult child. Um, uh, my son's health has spiraled. Um, he's to the point where he's lost his career and his marriage is in jeopardy. Um, he has moved in with me and my wife, and we're trying to understand the depth uh, of his uh, situation and certainly uh, find him 
uh, the help he needs to get back on his feet. It's Easter season, the time of rebirth and growth. Uh, we just need to locate the resources to help us. And so that's why I'm a caregiver at this point. And Deidre. I think you're on mute. All right, here I am. Thank you, sorry about that. Hi, Alan and everyone, my fellow panelists. I'm Deidre McGee, and I started my caregiving journey in my 20s. I was a year out of college. I started taking care of my mother. And then shortly thereafter, my father, um, who was at home getting care, and then he ended up going into a nursing facility. And then later on, I started taking care of a great aunt who had in-home uh, private care. So I've seen um, all spectrums of caregiving in the facility and at home and um, in the hospital. So, and I'll go into more detail as we get into the panel discussion. So glad to be here today. Great. Thank you, and thank the three of you for being here and sharing your journey. Um, I wanted to just kind of to put things into perspective to kick this off. I wanted to give us some statistics that I had um, gotten from the AARP and the National Alliance for Caregiving. Um, and so as we enter into the discussion of caregivers, we're really going to focus our attention here on family caregivers, unpaid caregivers for the purposes of this discussion. We know there's lots of professional caregivers out there at different levels, but really today we're focusing the discussion on family caregivers. Um, so one in every five people in the United States are providing unpaid care for an adult. That equals about 53 million people that are unpaid caregivers in the U.S., and that's up from about 43 and a half million just five years ago. So it really has grown as our booming uh, baby boomer population is growing and people need more care and they're living longer. So the number of unpaid caregivers have really um, gone up quite a bit. About 25% of the caregivers are providing care for more than one person. And about 5% are caring for three or more people. So not only are we you know, juggling our own careers, our own families, maybe our children, if we're in that, what we call the, the, um, the sandwich generation, where you have somebody in the middle caring for an aging parent or caring for children at the same time, but we're also seeing people that are caring for multiple people in their family, um, sometimes three or more. So that's about 37 billion hours of care that is unpaid. And the estimated cost of that care is $470 billion. Now, I'd like to note that that care that we're talking about, there are a lot of other hidden costs, other components of financial loss. So when I, when I say that, I mean, it's not only our time that otherwise would be paid as a caregiver, I mean that family caregivers are also purchasing items to support their loved ones, things like groceries, medications, medical equipment, but they're also taking time off work to take people to medical appointments. Or some, as we've seen, especially during the pandemic, a lot of people stopped working altogether because it came such, um, it was such a juggle to be able to do everything at once. So some people are actually no longer working. Um, statistically, there are still about 60% of the caregiving population are still working. So they are still trying, trying to juggle a lot of different things. Um, the average caregiver is 46 year old, white and female, but I do not want to discount the, dis the differ diversity of unpaid caregivers. Um, we have 64% white, 16% Hispanic or Latino, approximately 10% African American, 7% Asian, and the others are just a mix or, or unknown. 9% um, identify themselves as LGD, LGBT, I'm sorry, um, LGBT. Um, and then we're seeing about 96% of the population, the caregiving population, are providing assistance with ADLs, those activities of daily living, things like bathing, dressing, toileting. But 6% are forming more complex medical and nursing tasks. So people are kind of doing things all across the board, not just the housekeeping or helping with meals, 
but they may be doing bathing, they may be um, cleaning out feeding tubes and doing more complex kinds of things as well. So 40% of our unpaid caregivers are over the age of 40. 18% fall within the 30 to 40 year old range, and about 14% fall at the 20 to 30 year range. So I wanted to um, give the folks on the panel a minute to talk a little bit more in detail about their caregiving journey. Deidre, would you like to start? Sure, thanks, Ella. So yeah, as I mentioned, I was in my 20s, I'm 23 to be exact, um, when I started taking care of uh, my mother um, who was diagnosed with colon cancer. And I thought she was going to pull through and she ended up uh, succumbing to cancer. She, um, I remember driving her to the hospital. It was like Memorial Day weekend this month, about in 1991, at the end of this month, 1991. And then by Flag Day, she was gone, like June 14th. Like, so she went quickly. And I was just devastated. I, here I was, a young adult woman, a year out of college, just starting my young adult life, and my mother was gone. And then um, my father, who was 12 years, my mother's senior, she was uh, she was 57 when she died. She died a nine days shy of her 58th birthday, which was which was young back then in 91. And but my father was like a father. My father that raised me was, and my mother that raised me. That's that's another story. But uh, my father that raised me was 12 years my mother's. Um, senior. So he was kind of like a father and a grandfather, you know, all in one for me. So um, he had just turned 70. And so um, he started, he had a, a stroke from multi-infarct dementia. And then um, I was caring for him at home. So I just couldn't do it any longer because I was the only one doing it out of my other siblings. And I realized one day when the nurse didn't show up um, in the snow and I had to stay home from work that he was going to need 24-hour care. Um, in order to get the full care that he needed. And it, and it was a tough decision because I really didn't want him to be in a nursing facility. But, you know, for him to have the quality of life for the remainder of his life, you know, it was the best decision. So um, so going along, he's um, in the facility. He lived seven years in, in afterwards, um, which is considered long, I was told. But um, during that time period, the last two years, um, I started taking care of his aunt, my great aunt. Um, and once again, I just got out of grad school. I mean, I, I mean, literally, like I was just graduated two days later. Two days later, I met her doorstep, <laughs> um, checking on her. And uh, it would have been my dad being her caregiver, but he was sick, so she didn't have any kids. The last of nine siblings, and I was her niece, the closest niece to her. And I just kind of put myself in her shoes and say that could be me in my old age. You know, when I want someone to be there for me, and so. Um, her and my dad ended up passing within two months of each other. And by that time I was 32. So I'm like, I'm 23. If you transpose 23, you get 32. From 23 to 32, here I was, a caregiver. And all of my friends were um, getting marriage and getting the baby carriage, and I'm, I'm a caregiver. And so now at 54, you know, I'm helping others who are caregiving, you know, in their, um, golden years and their senior years and kind of give support and guidance. And so I thought I would um, help out by being on this panel of the day to be a support to others. So that's my story in a nutshell. Back to you, Ellen. Yeah, so you're one of the 5% that was caring for more than, than three other people at a time. Um, but what what is it being a young caregiver, what would you, what is it you wish your 20 year old self knew back then? I wished that I was had this. Well, I would say I will have. I did have support. Um, you know, I was in some support groups, but I didn't know what what it all mean because what it all meant. Because I was trying to find my identity at the same time. I had um, I found out later that I was um, adopted, and so like my parents that raised me were my adoptive parents, but I knew that I was on a mission to care for them because. They cared for me, you know. They they adopted me at, at, as an infant, and I felt like it was my responsibility to be there for them. And even regardless of what my siblings were doing or weren't doing, and what other family members weren't doing and weren't stepping up, that it was my duty. Um, so you know, I, I just I wish I could have just had more. Would have been maybe more prayerful, more steadfast. That you know, I didn't know what the end was going to be. Like you know, I kept thinking about. 
Um, what if, I, if something happens to me before them? You know, I'm the caregiver. Like that's always the fear. You start thinking about your own mortality and who's going to be there for you. But, you know, I knew I was doing the right thing. You know, I didn't know who was going to pass. It could have been me. I could have passed first, but I knew I was doing the right thing as a daughter, as a niece. I was prepared as an adult, you know, to um, take on responsibilities and be there for them like they were there for me. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And it is, it is really hard as we're doing this caregiving journey. A lot of times there's no script for us and everybody's journey is different and the person we're caring for is different. So sometimes you feel like you're stumbling along and figuring it out as you go, but you're right. Yeah. Just finding that support network to help you with that is really, really important. Um, yeah. No, so you, you're on this panel because you're, you're a little bit unusual in some ways, as far as not meeting that 46 year old female who is the average caregiver. Share, our, share your journey with us and also how it is, maybe how it's different, maybe how it's very much the same as a male being a caregiver. Thank you, Ellen. Um, yeah, I certainly was not expecting this. Um, with, both, with both my parents passing um, over a decade ago, um, I didn't think caregiving would be in my future, except perhaps with my wife. So this came as quite a surprise for a young person. Uh, we all love our family members. We'll do what we can for them. Um, but it was certainly a much worse situation than any of us knew. And the question is, um, what are we going to do to rally around uh, this particular health situation and um, and help him get through this. Um, well, we've only been doing it about two months and it's already taken its toll. I'm not telling you all anything you don't already know. It doesn't take long for the emotional toll, the financial toll, um, and then the question of family dynamics uh, pops up a lot too. And so we're trying to uh, be very respectful of an adult who can make his own decisions. Um, and he just needs a little more guidance at this time and we want to get him back on his feet. We don't have all the answers yet as to what he's dealing with, but as most of you know, it's an onion. Okay. And, you know, we're, we're really only at the top layer. So, um, you know, I, I would tell people, um, it is an honor and a privilege to help somebody else because um, uh, as um, Deidre said, you know, it could be us. And we want to make sure, you know, that we get the same respect. Um, we, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. And looking for resources, finding the right resources um, and support group or counseling, which I highly recommend, will help you as an individual find your way through this. So we have a lot of hope, no matter how it ends. Um, Thank you, no. And I'm the only one in the area for him and and we're gonna we're gonna get him through this. So it was an easy, it's a very easy decision in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. So Jackie, talk to us a little bit about your care giving journey. All right. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and to my um, panelists, as well, because um, your stories are, are definitely very moving. Um, and you're right, we all come from a different um, perspective and a, and, a, and a different journey. Um, you know, as I said, my journey began um, with the passing of my siblings, feeling very much um, responsible to kind of make sure that you know someone's looking out for mom and dad and i certainly am not going to say that my brother does not help because he does but i think it's different for a daughter than a son um you know we all have different you know different jobs different responsibilities um recently i i saw a, a magazine i think it was called brain and health and ellen you might recognize um the, the picture spoke to me, like as soon as I got the magazine and I opened it, um, I wish I had it right here to, to show, but 
it was a picture of a, I think a woman in the middle and she had on a raincoat. And she also had an umbrella in one hand kind of reaching, um, you know, to take care of the children. And then she was balancing another umbrella on her back foot. So one leg on the ground to kind of, for the stability and one arm in the air and a foot in the air and trying to do the balancing act, like the umbrella over the parents and the umbrella over the, you know, the children. Um, but, you know, all in all, I guess the, the takeaway for me is that those umbrellas did provide, you know, some support. Like, even though it's hard to balance everything, those umbrellas were in place. Um, so, you know, my journey, I think 10, 12 years ago, started pushing like my parents to, you know, hey, you guys, you know, it's a good idea. Maybe you should. Um, move closer to me because then I can, you know, help a lot easier with meals and help with things. And for one reason or another, and I ex I understand, and, and just like um, Noel was saying and just like Deidre was saying, is that the respect and what their wishes are that they had in their um, crawl that they had a daughter that passed away with children and they wanted to be pre-positioned for them. So it wasn't really something that they really bought into, you know, the idea of moving. Um, so, you know, as, as the journey goes, um, you know, I would, I would push on the gas pedal, you know, and I would take them to different places and show them around and see what they thought. And I'd be really excited, like, oh, they really like it. And then they would be like, no, but it's just not going to work, you know? So I'd be like, you know what? Okay. Um, you know, I'll let off the gas pedal, come about another idea, you know, develop something else that seems to, you know, maybe be a solution. Um, and I think that's been, so my, my caregiving journey has not been a journey of physical on hands, you know, helping somebody eat and helping someone drink and get dressed because I've been very blessed, very, very blessed with parents that have been able to do those things for themselves. Um, so I, you know, I, I definitely take away that um, it is a journey. Um, there is no right and there is no wrong. There are solutions that you try um, and things that, you know, work and things that don't work. Um, so I'm gonna hand it back to Ellen. <laughs> before I take too much time. <laughs> no, no, thank you for sharing. Um, the common theme that I'm hearing with all three of you was a, a big part is just finding the supports, finding the resources, educating ourselves on what's out there and what's available to help support us, kind of creating this care plan, so to speak, of what's gonna work best for our family because everybody's is different. Um, Jackie, you're, you're a professional care manager, so you provide care in a professional way, and you're also a family caregiver. How did those two roles differ, and how are they the same? So the, the one word that comes to mind for me is, as a professional care manager, um, the word objectivity uh, comes to mind, uh, that I can meet a client uh, and a family and look at it from all different perspectives. Um, I can weigh in on different solutions and I can be mindful of my own emotions, but it's not the, the biggest role coming out. I'm not emotional to the, uh, um, extent that I would be as a personal caregiver because of your blood relation and the longevity of, of that relationship that you've had with someone. So um, I think the, the, the takeaway word for me is objectivity. As a care manager, you know, I, I'm sensitive to um, what they're going through and able to provide suggestions and solutions and make it work for them, but not necessarily make it work for my own 
family members, um, which which is tough. I mean, it is. It's it's very tough, and we all have, you know, those situations that we still have to monitor and still have to kind of you know put attention to. Um, so, I think that's the the best answer I can give you is objectivity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to share how they um, take care of themselves? Because as caregivers, we really need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. So like you said, Deidre, you, didn't, you don't want to pass first. You don't want to get yourself where you're delaying your own medical care or the stress or the burden has become too much. So how did you guys deal with that caregiver stress and burden? And how do you, how do you deal with it in a healthy way? I can go. I, think, yeah, I was going to say, I think all of us. Yeah, go ahead, Deidre. Go ahead, Deidre. Okay, so I'll say for me, so I had joined a support group um, for, like through the Alzheimer's Association because my dad, as I mentioned, he had dementia from um, multi infarct dementia. He had a stroke. And then my aunt, great aunt, just was you know, losing her memory. And so, you know, we would meet once a month and it would be everyone from parents. Um, People take care of caregivers, taking care of parents or um, children or spouses. And that was just a godsend. Like it was at a church and we met once a month. And then um, I would travel a lot for work. So sometimes I would need um, so, like someone to provide what they call respite care. So that when you're away, um, whether you're on vacation or for work, um, you know, someone would come to stay with your loved one. And sometimes there was a lot of guilty feelings around that because you know you're going away to, 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 for your self-care or for a business trip and but you need someone to, to stay with your loved ones and i guess it's kind of like child care when you leave your child for the first time in child care and you, someone's taking care of them while you work it's the same type of thing but you know with your older parents you have to give them that respect mm -hmm. and leave them with their dignity they're not a child and mm -hmm. they're going to remind you that you're still the child you know when you're taking care of them but um but just making sure those provisions are in place, you know, while you get the respite you need and the, and your self care. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting you'd say that because often we do as adult children caring for an aging parent, they are the parent, we are the child, but our roles are actually starting to reverse. Um, exactly. And sometimes you get that that little uh, tension with that dynamic, and it becomes sometimes a little bit challenging. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to chime in a little bit. Um, my situation being a bit different, I'm trying to keep it adult to adult, right? Because the parent to child doesn't work. Right. Right. <laughs> he is a young adult. He is responsible for his own decisions. Um, I think communication has been absolutely one of the most difficult things we've had. Um, and that's not just the interpersonal communication, trying to figure out how he's feeling, or what's going on, but it's a question of how you frame your question. You know, your language, I think, is very important because we can feel it all inside and you you just want to say something. Um, but I, I highly recommend you don't do that. That's not, you don't want to vent about the situation with the individual. It just doesn't help. Um, so I, rely on others who will listen to me. I've got lots of friends, um, you know, I've got some neighbors, they like to go on walks, and so we'll walk and we'll talk. So I'll burn it off and sort of unburden myself. Um, it's not that they have any answers, but they listen. Um, I also highly recommend two other things. Counseling has always worked for me. Um, and so I've retained a counselor and that's a great way to pose questions to a professional about the situations you know, that I'm dealing with and to get an answer. So I'm better prepared for what's coming because my issue being a male and being the youngest in my family is mm -hmm. I really don't understand how to really care for people, if you know what I mean. It's, it's a strange thing, um, but I've had a lot to learn and um, the second thing I'll say is, you know, your community-based um, care managers, you know, 
because you need a resource. You need more than one resource. You need plan A, you need plan B, you need plan C, I'm learning. We've even moved to plan D, who would have known? Something we thought was pretty simple and straightforward clearly is unraveling. And um, you don't know where to turn. And I think that's true for everybody who's on the phone call. What do you do? And I am finding great help from um, care managers to help guide me through this, most certainly to guide um, you know, my son through this. And uh, the resources that are being provided are things I never would have thought of. So what could have been an even worse situation, as bad as it is, I feel like you know, we're, we're already moving in the right direction. It'll be a slow, slow process. But you know, when you feel like you've got a little bit of hope and a little bit of help, um, it really, really helps a lot. Thank you. Yes, I'm hearing counseling. I'm hearing physical exercise, walking and talking, mm -hmm. confiding in a friend, getting professional support through the Alzheimer's Association. Um, which, by the way, if anybody is interested in getting information about support groups, you can go to alz.org, that is the website for the Alzheimer's Association, and you can find community or virtual support groups. Um, we, we offer them here at the option group as well through the Alzheimer's Association. We're based in Hunt Valley, but there are many support groups across the state. So please go to alz.org to get information. Um, so we heard some really good suggestions of ways to take care of yourself, Jackie. How, what did you find was helpful helpful for you? I have found um, that more so like physical activity, um, really trying to make sure, you know, whether it's walking. Um, I know that during, actually during COVID, um, I had never done yoga before in my life. So, you know, kind of wasn't something... Um, but I, I wound up kind of wrenching my back at one point and a doctor said to me, have you tried that? I said, no, but I'm willing to. And I gave it a whirl and I really enjoy, um, the benefits of it, not only the physical benefit of it, but the, um, the mindfulness and the, um, ability to take and carve out. And when I say you have to carve it out, cause it's so easy to like, Oh, something else takes priority, but I've tried really, really hard to carve out the time to, you know, to do that. Um, it can take on the form of in your own house with a tape um, or a disc rather. <laughs> I'm aging myself, sorry. Um, or you can go to a studio, you know, whatever seems to work for you, but it's carving out the time and taking that time for yourself and not feeling guilty about it because we all deserve, you know, that time to, you know, be able to let go of all the other, you know, put the phone down, turn the volume off, um, you know, be able to turn inside and really um, evaluate um, and help to get back in balance if that seems to be the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ellen, can I just add to that? Yeah. Real quick. So I, I just think about caregiving. It's kind of like when you're on the plane and they say put the oxygen mask on first and then assist the child or assist right. the other person. You know, you can't help anyone unless you help yourself right. first. Like you can't be the caregiver if you're sick and you haven't done your self-care. And that could even include, you know, just getting a massage and taking right. the day off yourself so just wanted to add that thank you for sharing yeah that's that's definitely one of the ways that i often describe it is i have this this cup of water and i'm going to hold it straight out <clears throat> how long can i do that right i i could do it it's easy it's light it's you know a couple ounces i'm just going to hold it here and we'll keep on doing the presentation and i could hold it you think i could hold it for an hour probably <laughs> how about a day how about a week? How about a year? Even though it seems like it's very tiny and it's something that I can handle, after a while you need a break. You need to put it down. You need to do something else. And that's what we're talking about. When Deirdre, you mentioned respite and somebody else mentioned about bringing in other family members to kind of help support. 
some of it is just finding a ways to carve out time so we're no longer that that caregiver and we can be ourselves or we can be the mom to our children or we could be the dad to our you know children so it just we just want to to find ways to allow us to do other things besides just being a caregiver because we're we're complex beings and we're identified ourselves much more than just as a caregiver. A um, couple people mentioned guilt. How does guilt come into this? Mentioned about feeling guilty. How were you, what were you feeling guilty about and how did it kind of raise itself? Well, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, I know that um, as a caregiver, you know, trying to kind of carve out that time. For instance, uh, I may go away for a weekend with my husband to a concert or something. And the thought of, oh gosh, you know, what would happen, you know, what happens if I'm not there? Um, but I guess um, I've, I've been very blessed to be able to talk myself through, like I am not the only one person and very blessed to have relatives, you know, to kind of help pull in, you know, when necessary to kind of um, lighten, you know, lighten the load a little bit um, to feel like I could actually like go away, you know, jump in my vehicle and, and be gone for 24 to 48 hours, usually not much longer than that, but be able to be away and not feel the guilt. But it's really easy to feel the guilt because um, you know, if something should happen, then of course, you know, I'm going to feel that. But I think, um, I think that's what kind of comes to mind for me for that. Anyone else like to add to that? Yeah, I would just say, I, I mean, it reminds me of just kind of like the five stages of grief that, you know, when you're dealing with loss, especially when someone has dementia, it's, they call it the long goodbye. So you, you know you're dealing with you know, you're depressed about it you feel sometimes angry because people aren't helping like you know other family members um and then you have the bargaining you know maybe if i would have done this this wouldn't have happened put this in place <laughs> you know all those types of things but you know once you make your decision then you've got to you know move forward on the, the type of care you know for your loved one but still you know the guilt kind of creeps in and then just the, um the acceptance, um, you know, comes, you know, toward the end, but all the other stages, the depression, the anger, the bargaining, and the denial that this is really happening. I can't believe, you know, I'm in this caregiver role and, and all of that, but, you know, you have to kind of press forward, um, not take on the guilt and let that internal dialogue, you know, beat, beat you up. And then just make sure that you know the self-care is in place. And I, I will say that when you asked me what would I tell my younger self, um, I thought about um, worry. I was the chief worrier. Like I worried a lot like, about every time you know I put the respite in place or you know when I made certain decisions. You know I just worried about everything. And I remember my attorney at the time. She was just like, "Deidre, stop worrying. You know, like every, everything's in place. You're doing the right thing." You know? So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a lot of times as caregivers and family units, we we there's a, that elephant in the room called family dynamics. So it's a lot of it's about communication with other family members, and a lot of it's about who is the one that's local versus the one that's long distance. Um, how did you guys alleviate if you if you experienced those family dynamics that kind of got a, in the way of the caregiving role? How did you alleviate it or what strategies did you use? It's been difficult. Um, I'm dealing with a generation that prefers to text, not talk. And I can't tell you how frustrating that is. You know, sit down, have a meeting have an adult conversation, work something out. We all know it's not going to get better unless you resolve it. And texting is no way to do that. So that's that's confusing. Um, and I also don't like the triangulation. Um, it doesn't it doesn't work for me, you know. 
a member of the family providing their take on things, um, but they're not they're not the primary person involved. It makes it very difficult to think that you're making the right decision because it's being questioned. Um, it's hard. It's, it's very it's very difficult. I can't say I've, I have an answer. I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out ways to respond appropriately, yet still do what I think is best and right. Uh, a lot of it is is asking asking the individual. You know, what do you want? And I think I've learned that instead of just that adult to child role that we talked about earlier. You know, the one you automatically assume, you know, it has to be more adult to adult and that person has to have a role in what's happening. You just hope they want to engage. Can I chime in on that? I, you know, I will say, um, getting back to my younger self, so other things are starting to prop up now. I was the youngest out of all my siblings. So, you know, I was looking to them to lead and to help out with the caregiving. And they were looking at me like, who are you to tell me? You know? And you know, I was basing it on everything I've read and research about caregiving. And you know, it was tough because I didn't um, feel like I had a say or a voice. And I felt like my boundaries were being crossed. Mm -hmm. And you know, there were a lot of emotions, a lot of tears. And you know, I just pressed forward with my support group and the professionals that helped me. Um, yeah. Because I didn't know how to speak up for myself because I was feeling like, you know, because I was the youngest, they, I wasn't being respected, but I was like, look, they took care of us. You know, we have responsibility to take care of them regardless of what happened or, how, you know, in your life or what you didn't like or whatever, you know, so my mindset was totally different at the time, but, you know, I had to press forward and get support that I needed. Yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. It's um it's very interesting. Um, so Deidre, you're the youngest. Um, Noel, you said you're the youngest, and mm -hmm. I am the youngest as well. And I mm -hmm. I guess for me it was, you know, the the oldest is a son, and his head is turned in another direction. And once again, certainly not. Uh, you know, he does help. He absolutely does. But as the you know a daughter, I just it was it wasn't even a question because of how they loved me, you know. What would you say is the most surprising thing that came out of being a caregiver? What was the most surprising thing for you, Deirdre? I'll say that, you know, I'm wiser and I'm stronger and I'm able to pay it forward. You know, I'm able to help others and share my journey. Because a lot of my friends at the time, they didn't know what I was talking about. I'm in my 20s, 30s caregiver. And now they're in their 50s, 60s, and now it's like, they're listening now, like they, they understand. <laughs> so being able to give back and support others and give them the resources that they need is rewarding. And, you know, you know I wouldn't change the journey at all mm -hmm. because I felt like it, it happened the way it was supposed to happen at the right time. And um, I was being educated through the, my support group and different professionals and everything just proceeded the way it should have. Jackie, what was your surprising takeaway? Um, my surprising takeaway, um, there, I guess there were a couple of things that kind of trickled into my mind. Um, one was that when you when you reach out for help, I was never ever. I don't think you know over the years. I don't think anyone has ever said, "Oh no, I can't. I'm sorry. You know, not going to help." That that people were like, "Oh yeah, you know, just let me know where you know, where do you want me to be? Uh, you know, what can I do?" and and that to me um, really, it, it, it gave me a warm feeling to kind of say, wow, I, you know, all I needed to do was ask and, and you know, perhaps maybe didn't realize that um, occasionally. So um, 
that was definitely, um, you know, one of the most surprising things. Um, I knew I was going to say, I know there were other ones, but I think I'll just kind of settle on that for right now. No, is there anything that was surprising for you as a caregiver? Well, it's still unfolding, Ellen. Um, yeah. But I would say finding the help in the community has, has been the best thing. I'm not saying it's surprising. I just didn't know where to turn. Mm -hmm. um, and we had some false starts and boy, that was hard. Um, but once you find the right resources, um, and that's, I mean, I think that is critical, you know? Mm -hmm. You really need to do what's best for the individual that you're caring for. So that means you have to give up part of yourself. And, uh, and I'm okay with that. I'm not, that I'm saying this to you, yeah, we have sacrificed a lot and there will be a lot more and I'm okay with that. I'm not so sure my younger self would have, would have done that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're in this place. It is what it is. What are you going to do about it? And I, I think what we all get out of it, uh, again, Deirdre, you have been wonderful in terms of sharing your experiences and um, I, I agree with a lot of things that you have been able to verbalize that's not necessarily my strength either but um, i hear it and it's like i feel it and um, and we got to take care of each other that's the bottom line you know through the support groups anything that you can find anything that you can give back um i know we're all in a tough spot we're in the middle of it but we're going to come out of this and um, how can you help somebody else? You know, I, I think this is laying some groundwork for me for something in my future that I was not prepared for. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Alan, just to add, and also it, it prepares us for planning our own legacies mm -hmm. and the rest of our own lives. You know, as we care for others, we're looking at our own selves mm -hmm. in the future. In the future, absolutely. And she did it again, ladies and gentlemen. She is so good yeah. at stating things that we understand. And, and that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. How can yeah. we help? How can we help? Yeah. How can we help our family members? I mean, this is going to happen. So is your paperwork in order? Your own? Are you looking for paperwork for somebody you're caring for? Do you know how difficult it is? Can't you plan things now so your family? You know, when things happen, it's easier on them. Yeah, that's that's part of what I've learned too over the years. Absolutely. So, you know, if you if you're putting things off for yourself, self care being one, you really got to put that number one. But think about the others in your family, and and make it easy on them. So, yeah, these are all things that are coming out of this. Yeah. Planning ahead, being proactive, really figuring out what it is that we need to. To, to continue on this journey. Yeah. Um, kind of to wrap it up here, um, what what's the most rewarding piece for each of you as a caregiver? What's been the most rewarding? Deandra, how about you? I would say being there for my parents and my great aunt, you know, in their final years, their golden years. Um, you know, knowing that, you know, I did the right thing and I stepped up um, even when, you know, I didn't always get the support from family, but mm -hmm. I felt like God really put the right people in place at the right time. Yeah. Um, and it was just a manifestation of um, everything being divine timing and being spiritually aligned. I didn't understand it all at the time. I was just, I was on autopilot you know, from 23 to 32, like just, uh -huh. just going through the motions. But, you know, in the end, it all worked out. When I look back, you know, it was, it was I was the chosen one. At first I asked, why me? Why, why me, God? And then God was saying, why not you? You know, uh -huh. so that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> 
Jackie, what was most rewarding for you? Um, I absolutely uh, agree with Deidre um, that there is divine intervention. I think, I think sometimes a little bit goes a long way and making little tweaks here and there um, really, I think, made a difference on, I'll say, my parents' longevity. Um, you know, I mean, God bless my dad um, that uh, he lived to 92 and my mom is 87. And, you know, we hear every day how folks, you know, oh my goodness, you know, someone passed away and you hear their ages and, you know, we don't always know all the circumstances, but um, I think, you know, being able to be a part of their journey um, and knowing that, you know, doing one little thing like vacuuming for my mother <laughs> can can make a difference for her. You know what I mean? It's not a big deal for me, but but it's just knowing that, you know, that it has lifted someone else up. Um, and by lifting them up, it lifts us up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Ellen, I'll, I'll I'll just wrap wrap it up by saying um, I'm I'm seeing progress. It's slowly but surely, step by step. Um, and the fact that you know we're there for him in a difficult time. Um, and seeing that he is uh, responding, because I don't know if I mentioned this, he, he's living with us. Um, and, you know, I, every now and then I see I see the wonderful person I saw growing up, you know, so still in there. Um, and, and that's exciting to see, because we'd like to see him return to, to that. So I've got a lot of hope. Could not have done it without help. I mean, and that's again. I just I just praise the professionals that are helping us find the right resources because you know it's it's when when people don't get the resources. I mean, what what are they going to do? You know, some things don't turn around by themselves. They get worse, and that's not the life anybody needs to live. So, you know, we're a social society. We try to help each other. Doesn't matter whether they're family or somebody through the Alzheimer's group. I mean, we're all there. We're walking together. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of hope. Thank you. On, on that note, having hope. <laughs> um, yeah. Just we're going to wrap it up real quick. I did want to mention to the audience that the um, the caregiver stress test that is in the chat and that Jeff shared with you is something that you can take on your own. Um, and it's something you can keep that form because you can kind of, it's a litmus test as you go through that journey, you may be more stressed at certain times, but if you're finding that you're at the threshold where you are stressed, reach out to your resources, get the additional help, get the respite, get rally the troops to help you out. It's really important to take care of yourself as a caregiver. Um, Jeff, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I don't know if you've had questions in the chat. People would like to chime in. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Um, we do have a few comments, um, and I'll say to all of our attendees, now would be a great time to get any questions that you have um, into our questions panel or chat. I'm going to open up the mic here um, briefly for a few minutes as well. Um, I'll just say that um, just a tremendous amount of appreciation and respect for our panelists for sharing their stories. Um, not easy to do, um, though you all certainly made it look easy and sound easy. So uh, really appreciate um, your time uh, and for being here with us today. And Ellen, thank you so much for uh, leading the panel and being part of our webinar series um, as always. So thank you to all of you. Um, we do have some um, comments that have come through um, over the last uh, several minutes, <clears throat> and then I'll open up the mic as we uh, close here. Um, so let me go up just a little bit here. 
Uh, we have one person that said uh, Deidre described herself as a warrior. I would say that she and all of the other caregivers are warriors. Um, and then we have a question. Um, in the heat of the moment, when you develop st strategy of communication, at that moment in time, when it was not working, what did you do? I, I, I will respond. Um, I know that along the journey with communication, that I know that I can say something clearly and be very, um, be very clear at the message that I'm trying to get across, but because it's a family member, that sometimes it falls on silent ears. They they won't hear it. So I have found um, sometimes a workaround where I will go to um, perhaps a good friend of the family that I know um, that they respect and you know, think the world of. And sometimes by going to that family member or excuse me, going to that friend and saying, hey, do me a favor, you know, can you drop a couple of little seeds of information? Um, you know, and sometimes that happening, it's a workaround. And once again, there are no absolute like rights and wrongs, but I have found that it has helped me. You know, some good friends of the family will say, oh, you know, hey, Miss Ruthie, you know, it's time for you to, um, why don't you move closer to your daughter? You know, say something that, that I've been saying all along, you know, um, where I'm thinking that it's the right thing to do, but it kind of falls on silent ears. So having someone else say it, sometimes it, it rings louder or rings clearer for them. Okay. We have another question. Um, is it okay if I provide contact information for the panelists to all of our attendees? Um, we have some people that would like to reach out to you individually. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have another comment. This information was phenomenal. My dad is the primary for my mom, but at any time, because he, he's been neglecting his own care, I will have to step in for both of them soon. So thank you for sharing that. And, um, certainly please take uh, some of the information today um, for yourself. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, what websites would you recommend for resources for home care? And also, what do you do when the person you are caring for is doing nothing to help himself, even though when aides come to the house, he cooperates, for example, getting into a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. Jackie kind of mentioned sometimes using another person to, to, to send that message, and sometimes they're not going to listen to the children or listen to family members, but having that professional come in, like the care caregiver is, has found ways to, to get cooperation. Sometimes care managers or other professionals in the field, again, it gives family a break, but the, the individual receiving care may just be more responsive. It doesn't become this argumentative thing. It's just a part of the routine. It's part of what's being requested. Um, some people in terms of communication may use mediation or other professionals to, to kind of facilitate that communication. Um, there also are some websites, some platforms. The one that comes to mind is LOTSA Helping Hands, L-O-T-S-A, LOTSA Helping Hands.com. And that is a platform where the whole family care team can Put information there's a calendar of all the doctor's appointments you can write in there when you need coverage for somebody to sit with mom and dad and that's a way to kind of facilitate the communication anybody can go in at any time see what the schedule is sign up to be able to take on some of those responsibilities whether it's delivering meals or going to doctor's appointments or just being a friendly visitor so those are some ways that we can help kind of build that team and also facilitate communication between all the parties who are helping you know we've often heard that it 
it takes a village to raise a child. Sometimes it takes a village to take care of our elders. Um, and it's really hard to do that as one person. Thank you. And I think you actually probably just answered this next question that just popped up. Um, how to set up a plan for a substitute to instantly spring into action so there is no loss of continuity of care, uh, in quotes, when completely dependent on caretaker and no family, unquote. How do you arrange respite alternate care for emergencies? So I think that's along the lines of kind of what you were just saying, Ellen. Yep, you're relying on your professionals. And part of it is educating yourself again on the options ahead of time. So if you're thinking of respite care like a facility, go visit the facility, see what they're like, see if you feel like they would be a good fit for your family member in the event there's an emergency. Figure out what it is that, what pieces of information you need to have on the ready so that if that becomes a necessity, you can do that. But working with care management is a perfect place for that, where you have that, that backup person who knows the resources can help navigate quickly. Once a care manager is on board and is familiar with the situation, they can jump in at a moment's notice. Okay, thank you. Well, we are actually at 1101, um, so a lot of great questions and comments. Thank you so much. So I wanna um, you know, respect everybody's time here. Um, let's see, we, um, we do have one more question. We'll go ahead and get to that question here. Um, and um, actually looks like a comment maybe, sorry. Uh, monitoring or caregiving at a distance is a challenge. On frequent trips, I would always run around getting groceries and so forth, leaving no time to actually share, quote, fun times with family members. My daughter suggested to just take family member on a fun local trip, even overnight. Some of my best memories. So thank you for sharing that. Great suggestion. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So um, we'll go ahead and end on that. Um, thank you again to everybody. Um, briefly, 30 seconds, um, I'll go ahead and send out our video for today. And if anybody still needs it, the uh, stress test that Ellen provided the uh, handout, and as part of our webinar series, Alan's going to be back on the 17th as um, uh, talking about part two of uh, after the dementia diagnosis as part of our monthly wellness series uh, with Ellen and Dr. Michelle Fritch. And then on Thursday the 19th, we have uh, Medicaid long-term care asset protection planning with our elder law attorney, Lindsay Moss. And don't forget about our annual client event on May 21st at 8.30 in the morning to noon. Last day to RSVP is tomorrow. So we certainly hope to see all of you there. It's gonna be a wonderful morning and really looking forward to seeing everybody again. So uh, with all that said, thanks again to all of our panelists and to Ellen, um, really appreciate it. Uh, this is a great idea. Deidre was actually the one to come up with the idea. So Deidre, thank you, um, great idea. And uh, appreciate you. Um, sharing your thoughts and being here with us today. So, and to our attendees, mm -hmm. thanks for the great questions and comments as always. We'll mm -hmm. see you again soon as part of the Elvo webinar series. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.